Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, so this is a uh, a patient who had prostate cancer, total prostatectomy, and um, on their follow-up choline PET CT, which is this one, which was done um, in June of this year, um, he, he had this uh, choline avid mass, kind of low rectum, and um, thickening. And so they opted in for a prostate cancer, I guess, or a prostate MRI for, um, because I guess it could be a prostate met, that's what they're worried about, or, or another primary cancer. Uh, and so on the, the MRI, there is this, um, you know, thickening, asymmetric thickening and diffusion restriction in the left, like, uh, I guess this would still be low rectum uh, within five centimeters of the uh, sphincter. So um, <clears throat> they went in and biopsied it, and this is actually a, a second primary uh, adenocarcinoma. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, can um, you tell yeah. me more about, I don't know much about choline pet. What, what uh, do you um, use that for? Uh, so the if you have a cyclotron, carbon-11 choline is a um, it is a precursor to uh, phosphatidyl choline. Like it's, it gets incorporated into the cell wall, and then cells that turn over rapidly are supposed to pick it up. Um, it's being used right now in prostate cancer um, follow-up PET CTs for like nodal mets. Um, it looks really similar to PSMA on. Um, on PET scans, uh, but PSMA is probably gonna be much better. Or it's been shown to probably be a lot uh, better. So um, it may be going away, but since uh, Mayo has a cyclotron, they use it to, to generate the carbon 11 and make the carbon 11 choline. Um, but yeah, so it, it's kind of a, it's gonna be taken up and, and theoretically anything that turns over um, cells a lot. That's kind of the, the basis of it. Neat. Um, yeah. And um, it, yeah. We use exumin like flucyclovine, but we're hoping to get PSMA soon. Yeah. So um, flucyclovine, uh, they don't like it as much as carbon 11 choline. And then this case isn't the best case of it, but um, theoretically, the urinary bladder uptake is less. Um, and it has, it, they're essentially equivalent, though. Um, the mechanism is a little different, but the, the sensitivity is supposed to be the same. As uh, and obviously, flucyclovine is just an L leucine analog, so it, it's just taken up like uh, any amino acid would be. Very cool. And you guys yeah. did not find the prostate cancer recurrence, no, no there's nothing, they didn't see anything in the, in the prostate bed, yeah, yeah. That is tricky though, with the bladder being bright like that, yeah. So, but anyway, cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty good case, I thought. Okay, a couple more people have joined. Anyone else have cases? Okay, so this is a case of a patient who had trauma and had um, multiple surgeries. And just wondering what you guys think about the abdomen here. Is it all calcified there? The yeah. So it's, um, it's very calcified and it's kind of linear. It's a long, what looks like basically like the peritoneum and in the mesentery, but um, kind of on the visceral peritoneal lining. Um, and then the really, and so when I saw this, I was thinking, you know, this looks like maybe there was extravasated barium, like maybe the patient had had a bowel perforation and some contrast had been extravasated and, and all this uh, but they did not have a bowel perforation and they did not get oral contrast. And then the interesting thing about this was that one week prior, they had also gotten a exam. Oops, this is all on fire. So actually a couple of weeks prior, they'd also gotten an exam and you can see that there's none of that calcification. And, um, but, but maybe a faint amount of it is starting here. Mm -hmm. um, and then also they had a hematoma in their chest wall. Um, the hematoma over here had no real, it had just maybe some faint calcification. 
And then by the time we were doing our exam, there was a lot of dystrophic calcification here. So I just thought it was interesting is basically, you know, this is basically just kind of dystrophic healing calcification that was laid down in this hematoma pretty rapidly, um, but also within the peritoneal cavity um, and uh, just within a couple of weeks. Um, I, I haven't seen something like this that rapid. Yeah, I've never seen it like this. Um, I looked at the patient's calcium level and it was normal. Their phosphorus was a little abnormal, but I was wondering if like, you know, maybe this was like metastatic calcification um, I did also find uh, a paper about encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. That's usually if a patient has a peritoneal dialysis catheter and they have, um, you know, a lot of inflammation and then eventually they basically develop like a cocoon yeah. abdomen. Cocoon, yeah. Like, abdominal cocoon, yep. Yeah, abdominal cocoon with a capsule around their peritoneum and that can calcify. Um, and that can mimic also another thing that can calcify is um, TB peritonitis. Uh, but anyway, this patient did not have TB, they did not have a PD catheter, they just had a lot of surgeries and pretty rapid, uh, basically, development of encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. Wow, cool case. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my next case is this one. Okay, this is um, a young woman in her 20s who developed this mass. She was also uh, pregnant. You can see that there's a very nicely enhancing posterior placenta, baby in the cephalic position. There was also a dermoid. There was lots of amniotic fluid. And then um, in the pancreas, um, we can see, or like in the Looked like it was kind of arising from abutting the, the pancreas. I think there's kind of like a claw sign here. Um, we see this large thick walled cystic lesion, it has some septations along the edge of it. It was occluding the splenic vein. What do you guys think? Any differential? So I thought um, this could be an MCN. It, it looked like it was like a thick wall. It's in the tail, it's in a female. Um, pretty, it's a young age for an MCN, but um, we're finding more and more of them younger. Um, so I thought this could either be an MCN and less likely a spend tumor. Um, spend tumors are in a younger female population, but they tend to have more solid components where the pseudopapillae are, and then more hemorrhage centrally. Anyway, this was resected, and this turned out to be a oligocystic serocyst adenoma with hyalinization of the wall and abscess formation. So I don't think we could have predicted that. Um, everything about this looks a little bit more like um, something else, especially the demographics. Um, but I just wanted to show you guys a paper. A paper. Um, so this is an interesting paper that was recently published, um, well, 2016, and it was um, combining um, uh, serious adenomas from multiple sites from about 2,600 sites um, or from the European Pancreatic Club. And a um, couple of interesting things they found was that the mean age was, the median age was 58. Um, and they basically said that, you know, we call this the grandmother lesion. And so we think about it in females and older females, but the average age has actually dropped 10 years um, because we're finding more of these um, incidentally and, and at a younger age. Um, so don't always think that it's just a grandmother. These can be younger patients. And in my case, my patient was in her 20s. Um, and then there is a female predominance. It's basically three to one. And out of these 2,622 patients, three of them developed a malignancy. And of those three that developed malignancy, it's, um, it's also unclear if it could be a, um, a sort of collision lesion where, you know, an adeno um, combined on top of a, a serous adenoma. So extremely low rate of malignancy if, it, if a rate of malignancy even does exist. And um, it is a little bit younger than we usually think of, um, but it, it does predominate more in females, about 75% um, in females. 
So, and then I tried to look up about hyalinization and abscess formation, and I could not really find much. So I guess it can happen, and, uh, but this was kind of a surprise for us. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, this is my next case. I'm hoping you guys are pulling up case as well and presenting these. Um, so you can see that the patient has some findings at their lung bases. And um, also these, you can see that there's obliteration of the fat planes around the aorta and the IVC, uh, kind of encasing this left renal vein here, but not causing hydronephrosis. There's some mesenteric lymph nodes, and then also like some more encasement of vessels down here and the vascular, like the soft tissue is kind of going along. Um, the vessels were kind of losing the fat planes also in the um, external iliac region as well. So any thoughts about this? Is this retroperitoneal fibrosis? Um, that's a great thought. So one yeah, thing that goes against it is that the, um, you would think that, you know, the ureter is gonna be somewhere here and they're not obstructed. This was not retroperitoneal fibrosis in the end. Can it be lymphoma? Uh, great thought also. Lymphoma is a really good thought for uh, encasing vessels. It tends to lift the aorta up. Um, good thought. I'll give you some additional history. This patient also has the, there's something in the lungs that's related to uh, what's in the abdomen. Sarcoid? Um, nope, but good thought. I think sarcoid usually has more like Nodule, yeah, small. Yeah, like micro nodules. This is kind of more like um, it looks like pneumonia, but it's also kind of flame shaped. Mm -hmm. That's a clue. Um, somebody from University of Arkansas is guessing IgG4. That's also a great thought. This was not IgG4, Kaposi. which also could be in the retroperitoneal fibrosis. Kaposi sarcoma. Mm -hmm. Yes, this was Kaposi sarcoma. Okay. So um, the lung is, it grows in this sort of peribronchovascular flame-shaped appearance, but in the abdomen, it can also grow in a perivascular distribution. So if you see, I, I kind of withheld the history that, um, oh, good, Gatanjali got it. Um, she typed into the chat, Kaposi is nice. Um, so um, if you see perivascular soft tissue, um, I, I withheld from you guys that the, uh, the history was also that the patient had HIV but this is a nice um, kind of classic appearance of Kaposi's. Uh, you can also see it growing along the portal veins into the liver. And um, another place that Kaposi's loves is the GI tract. So look carefully to see if you see any small bowel nodules. It's actually usually so tiny that we don't see it on imaging, but um, on EGD, they frequently will diagnose it in the duodenum or small bowel. Um, and then any lymphadenopathy also. Um, and then look at the skin too. Um, in this case, we did not see any nodules on the skin, but we, we've had other cases where we can actually see the Kaposi's on the skin. So I've seen it even going yeah, down the external iliac veins and like um, all of this kind of perivascular soft tissues uh, for Kaposi's. And then this last case is very cool. Okay, so this is a, uh, just start from the top. And focus on this uh, left paracola gutter region here. So there's a clue here in the inguinal region. And I'll show you the coronal as well. Is it a testis? Uh, it, so which, which is the testis? The one which is uh, up there. This, this huge, this is a testis? I'm thinking. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, good, it's a, you're close. 
You can see that there's a vessel going from the spleen down to this thing. Yeah. So uh, maybe an ectopic spleen or something. Uh-huh. And there's something else going on. What is this thing attached to the ectopic spleen? You know, gonadal fusion. Yes, good. Um, yeah, Steve is saying it's a little long. Yes, exactly. So this was actually an accessory spleen attached to the main spleen through this little vessel. Um, and then this is the testis. So this is a splenogonadal fusion. So splenogonadal nice. fusion can either be when you have um, attachment of the testis to either the spleen or an accessory spleen, or you can have it where it's called disconnected, where it's down in the scrotum, um, where you'll have um, either splenic tissue next to you or within the testicle in the scrotum. Um, this splenogonadal fusion is rare, um, but it is associated with crip orchidism. So placement of the testicle within the abdominal cavity. And um, that's what we have here. So that increases the risk for malignancy because this is uh, too warm for the testicle. So it, it develops um, dysgenesis and develop malignancy. Um, yeah, so anyway, this was a cool example of a uh, splenogonadal fusion. Oh, the other uh, reason, and actually this is the gonadal vein going right into our, our testicle here. And um, the, the reason this develops is that I think between the seventh and eighth week of life, the it always happens on the left side. And between the seventh and eighth week of life, the spleen is next to the gonadal ridge. And so it gets fused there. Um, it can be spontaneous and it can also be in, um, associated with limb abnormalities. And then um, if there's cryptarchidism, it can be associated with malignancy. Uh, Francesca is asking if the patient had surgery. Yes, they did um, basically remove um, the, the testicular portion of this because this was cryptorchidism. It had not yet developed into a malignancy. And Steve says rare. People say, what a cool case. Yep. Okay. And then I have one more quick one I can show you. Um, this is just a patient who is having GI bleeding. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of hyperdensity in their stomach. And then this was the arterial phase. And I'll just point out that we don't really see any active extravasation in this enlarged esophagus or within the stomach. And then this was the uh, delayed phase. You can see that there's a huge uh, GI bleed. So this patient had cirrhosis, they had um, esophageal varices, and they had this slow bleed. So if you only see it on the venous phase, it's still a bleed, but it just happens to be a slower bleed um, and or either a slow arterial or a venous bleed. In this case, this was a variceal bleed, so it's gonna be slower, uh, but a pretty, pretty large uh, bleed through these varices here. Okay, that's it for me. Anyone else? Yeah, Alti, I can show a very quick case. Okay, and I see Steve and Gane have joined, so we'd love to see any of your cases too. Nelly and Victoria are on vacation, so we're looking for more case presenters. Um, go ahead, turn. So, can you see my screen? So, so this patient um, came for um, PE rule out. <clears throat> and so, we have There's some septic emboli. So yeah, there are like multiple kind of uh, wedge shape and some are like peripheral. Uh, and um, then I'll let me show you the the full run, which was actually it was a full run, and we found something here. So it's kind of as if it's floating. Something is floating with within the contrast here, and can see that it's in the common iliac vessel. And uh, so any, any other thoughts? Someone is saying AR so COVID. What's that? 
that in the chat that somebody wrote AR so COVID. So uh, I was thinking DVT. Well, the case is from Arkansas, so right now everything is COVID. COVID, COVID. Yes, COVID is a, is a, is a good thought. So, so actually, I mean, if I, if I tell you the history, then it, should be, it will be a no-brainer. So let me show you. Um, so the patient actually also had a trauma. Recently. Like fat emboli? Yes, that's right. These are fat emboli. <laughs> so, so, so this was uh, associated with generally a large bone, like a femoral fracture, displaced femoral fracture. This was actually the the embolus, so, which was caught during migration, and and these are multiple emboli right there. Is there something about those lung findings that you would have suggested fat emboli? Like, is it because they're so kind of? Uh, typically, they don't have like any uh, uh, like findings which you would can say that these are these are fat emboli. Um, but I have seen a few cases. Uh, many times, these are these fluffy uh, peripheral lesions. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I, at least I don't know if uh, any particular uh, distinguishing characteristic just by looking at the emboli. So this is just just more like a history kind of a thing. Like, okay, do you have the patient has history of trauma or anything like that? So we did see an emboli which was just floating uh, in the vein here, and uh, and then this patient had a had a fracture. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I think Kader said he has one. Yeah, I I don't have the diagnosis yet, but I'd like to get everyone's opinion. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes. OK, yes. so this is a 29-year-old uh, woman who presents with abdominal pain, non-contrast, arterial venous delayed. And then I have an MR after this. Any thoughts based on? Can you make it a little bigger? Yeah, sure. Is that better? Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like a really large mass with enhancing components and it's affiliated with the hilum. <laughs> it's reminding me of like a um, mest tumor. Okay, I mean, I, and again, I don't have the final diagnosis yet, you know, but we will have it maybe in the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to show the MR now. It has a really, really T2 dark component. Yep. So it's almost like a fib fibrous kind of tumor. Yeah, that's what, that's basically what uh, what I thought that it's probably a fibrous tumor, but then the problem is it really doesn't enhance that much. It does enhance in the periphery, but um, hmm. so one of the differentials I did give was like a, you know, like a solitary fibrous tumor, but I wasn't sure. So if anyone has any other thoughts as to what. You can also get a lyomyoma of the renal capsule. Yeah, I guess that's possible. Except it looks like it's more, well, I mean, it's huge, so it could be really, you know, coming off anything. But, um, so I'll, I'll have a follow-up for you guys, but I just wanted to see what, what everyone thought about it, so. Do you have a CT by chance? Like, do you think any of that is calcification? Yeah, yeah, CT, um, I'll pull up the CT again, but there was no calcification. But it is it is uh, hyper dense on the pre. I don't know, but I think it's gonna be something benign. That's what, that is, that is exactly what I think too. But so my question was, has anybody, would you even give papillary cell as a differential in this? 
Yeah, I think you have to. <laughs> because <laughs> because, because vocabulary can be really dark and uh, can be large and it's much more common than like a rare thing, you know? Right. And, and the other thing we read about papillary was that once it becomes larger than four centimeters, it can get very, very heterogeneous. So it could be that. So, but I'll let you guys know. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, it'd be, I guess you, are you going to biopsy it or they're just going to remove it? I, I think they're, they're probably going to just remove it. Okay. Because if you biopsied it and it was a fibrous thing, then you could save the kidney to remove it. That looks like a total nephrectomy. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the kidney, I'm not sure because it's like right going into the renal pelvis. So I'm not sure uh, whether they could, but I, I don't know. Actually, we are presenting this case tonight during the GU oncology conference. So we'll see what mm -hmm. they say. And we'll cool, give let us know. Yep. All right. Okay, anyone else? Okay, have a good week. Sorry, we've been busy. So otherwise I would have brought cases. I apologize. No worries, no worries. Well, it's okay. I'm, I'm busy too. I'm got to go back to the list. So <laughs> um, I'll see you guys later. Bye. All right, thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.